So I know that I had some videos planned um, and don't worry, those are still coming. I'm in the process of moving out. So I'm, and all of the videos I suggested are going to take heavy research that's going to take a while. And I unfortunately just don't have the time for that right now. So I'm going to work on this. This is something that was kind of sparked by my most recent community post and the video I linked in it, which was titled how to win arguments on the internet, which went over a philosophical, um, checklist basically of how to determine the root of your disagreement and um, conclude what argument you should make. Um, so I'm going to link that video below um, because I think though it's not like a requirement to watch this, it'll definitely help, um, I guess, solidify this and give you a more fundamental understanding of it that's more applicable to any argument. But I've gotten a lot of comments on this channel, like a surprising and pleasant amount of people saying, I was kind of on the fence about xenogenders, but because of your videos, I changed my mind. Or I supported xenogenders and because of your videos, I changed my mind and things like that. And that's something that really means a lot to me. And also, if I'm being honest, makes me feel rather accomplished because it's very hard to change the mind of incluse, too cute, xenogender, all those kinds of people. So it's something that... I feel like I'm sort of qualified to talk about. So uh, let's just get into it. <gasps> so for my script for this video, I kind of have a list of different things that are relevant to this. And what I want to start out with is definitions, because like I said in that post, a key issue with um, this debate is that we hold very, very different definitions of most of the keywords in question. So although you can start the debate without agreeing on these premises, so you can say, this is my definition of this and I want it to be clear to you that I know that you are using this other definition. So whenever I say this word, I mean this, not what you mean when you say it. Although it is helpful to agree on the definitions, you need to make your definitions clear first um, before you can move on because otherwise it's going to get your argument very easily misconstrued. So I have some exclusive and inclusive definitions of each of these words. Um, obviously I'm an exclusive, so that's obviously going to be more accurate. I did do some research of really just reading posts and compiling the posts I have read over the last few years and my time being an inclusionist for what these are, but if any of them are not like up to date, let me know and I will make a pinned comment. Um, but I'm just going to go over them. I'm going to start with the exclusionist slash transmed definitions. Dysphoria, a discomfort with being perceived as your assigned gender at birth and, and or the body characteristic, body characteristics that portray you as that gender. Incongruence, the same as dysphoria. Gender euphoria, the other side of the coin to dysphoria and alleviation of dysphoria. Gender. Now, gender has two kind of, um, usually people agree with both of these definitions, but it, it's kind of unclear if people are just really true scum and don't really care about the trans med part or whatever. But generally, gender being the structure of your neurology as it relates to the average of each gender identity, which is experienced through feeling dysphoria for trans people. Now I'm going to go to the inclusive definitions again. If I get any of these wrong or misconstrued them, please let me know. And I will make a pinned comment. Dysphoria, the pain associated with not being perceived as your identified gender. Incongruence, the feeling of identifying with a gender different than that of which you were born. Gender euphoria, joy felt when being perce perceived as the gender you identify as. Gender, the social construct that allows you to be perceived as male or female or somewhere in between or whatever, and is usually perceived as a personal experience over a material part of your neurology. Now, I'm going to just go into some basic things. These are really just general argument things, but I want to make them clear before I continue. Uh, I'm just going to go through the bullet point list, honestly. Don't mock or insult. No ad hominems. feel like that's pretty straightforward, but sometimes it needs to be said. Try not to straw man and make sure that you're not unintentionally straw manning. If you don't understand their point or they said something that you didn't think they would, ask them to clarify. Do not make assumptions about any other beliefs on any other topics unless they have previously stated them aside from the dysphoria debate. This includes their opinions on xenogenders, self-diagnosis, non-binary people, anything other than the belief that you need dysphoria to be trans or anything else that you have seen them previously state. 
Do not fake claim people. I struggle with this one. Sometimes I argue with people and they've clearly shown to me that they're not trans and admit that they don't have dysphoria. And while I will admit I struggle with this one, it's not productive unless you're just ending the conversation and want to be like, okay, well, fuck you. <laughs> Do not engage with people who are not being serious or taking the or civil or taking the conversation seriously. If someone is like that person I showed in my last video who just responds to everything with my balls, you're not going to get anywhere with that conversation. And you need to either wait until that person is ready to have a serious conversation or just not deal with it. Also, this was not on my list, but I forgot to mention it. Don't misgender or dead name people. Even the people that I don't think are trans and will tell as such, I'm still not going to misgender because it's really not worth potentially causing someone pain because they may be confused. So I'm going to go into here about basically one of the main misunderstandings between these two sides, which is that the exclusionist side values scientific evidence and quality sources for their arguments. While I have seen countless comments from inclusionists saying that it's not a science issue, science doesn't matter because this isn't a scientific topic, I feel this way and that should be enough. This is a place that you need to start at. Explain why anecdotes are insufficient, as well as providing ample evidence that it is a scientific topic by providing scientific papers. By scientific papers, I don't mean scientific like news articles or like the Scientific American or anything. I mean like proper like published peer reviewed journals and explain that the presence of scientific studies in such large amounts does make it a scientific topic. And that even if they want to prove it is not scientific, they need to find an equally credible article to disprove the articles that you have presented, which will declassify it as a science issue. A big thing I do here is make comparisons where anecdotes are not sufficient in other areas. For example, har harmful or alternative medicine practices like Black Solve. I think most people would agree that a like cream or whatever it is that you put on your face that makes your skin fall off is not a treatment for cancer. The anecdotes provided by the people who say it is are not enough because there is scientific research to prove that this is harmful. Another one I like to make is religion, which may not be as easily made if you are religious yourself. However, for example, near-death experiences, people of basically every religion have seen their form of God, heaven, hell, the afterlife, whatever, in a near-death experience. This anecdote does not prove that their God exists because it is not consistent with our scientific understanding, as well as the fact that all of these anecdotes coexisting contradict with each other. They cannot all be true at once. And explain that the only place where an anecdote is sufficient is a place from either talking to a friend and trying to provide empathy without a concrete debate, or where there is no um, empirical evidence present where there have been no studies, there have been no surveys, there have been no polls, there's been nothing. It's just, it's never been studied. And the best we got is anecdotes. Another thing they like to say is that these studies are done to discredit trans people or harm trans people. However, almost all of the studies that I have linked in my sources explain why they did the studies, most of which are to make trans healthcare more precise and accessible. And for the ones that don't mention that, it's not like they're saying, oh, this is to obliterate trans people. It just doesn't mention a motive. And that these sources can be and have been effectively used against conservatives who don't believe being trans is real. That they are a good source for not only providing more precise trans health care, but also for dismantling the arguments of conservatives that you are not actually the gender you believe you are or that sex and gender are the same thing take snippets from studies that do talk about the mental health or transition benefits of these studies and take snippets of those studies as well as providing a link to them that explains that these studies are done with the goal of helping trans people and not um, harming them in any way. And obviously provide your sources for all of this as the last point. Don't just go trust me, bro. Find your sources and provide them. I will come back to sourcing at the end. Next is values. This pertains to the fact that even if an inclusionist will admit that gender is scientific, which has happened to me before, a lot of them will say even if it is scientific and xenogenders aren't real, it's more harmful to exclude people from the community than it is to just include them even if they don't exactly fit the definition. 
since this is an issue of values, it's going to be a lot harder to convince someone on this topic than it is on the validity of scientific sourcing. Explain your own reasoning for why you think um, exclusionist beliefs are helpful. Personally, what I wrote for myself is that it is keeping our support, our communities supportive, useful, safe, and limited to those who need it so it is not watered down. And that while these people who may be questioning their gender or be temporarily using unconventional gender identities do deserve a space to express those ideas, to hold those beliefs, and to feel the way that they're feeling, that place should not be a community for marginalized people. It should be a therapy group or a Discord server. That the LGBTQ community is not a fandom. It is not a therapy group. It is not something that's just supposed to be an all-around accepting place for everyone. And when I say accepting, I mean becoming a part of it, not just accepting people in general. That the LGBT community historically and currently is used to fight for our rights, to provide resources for our struggles that we share, in the case of trans people, provide information about good and bad trans healthcare providers, ask what to expect about surgeries, how to come out, things like that. Not being flooded with egg memes and this is so gender. And that those things can have their place, but they need to have their place in their own little area, not in a group that is there to support and advocate for marginalized people. And I personally try to make it very clear that I don't think that these people should be excluded because I think they're inherently terrible or not deserving of a place to feel accepted, but simply because this is not the place. They deserve a place to feel accepted and enjoy themselves and do what they want to do, but the place for that should not be what's essentially a support group for people who experience discrimination and hardships. And before I want to go into sourcing, which is the last point, um, other than like a closing thing of basically knowing when you need to stop, Make sure that you are listening to them too. Do not solely focus on getting your next argument out, assuming what they're going to say and forming an argument based on that before they even send anything, but actually listen to them and be willing to admit when you're wrong. Personally, I do not think it's wrong because I still believe it, but there could be, I mean, I could be wrong entirely, but I could also be wrong in smaller areas and change accordingly while either maintaining or changing my exclusionist beliefs. You can't argue with someone if you're not listening to what they're saying back. So while yes, a lot of them use tired and poor arguments and fallacies, and it's pretty reasonable to expect that, that does not mean you should be pre-formulating your next argument in your head based on that. You should wait for them to respond and take your time formulating a response. Don't worry about, oh no, they're going to think I gave up and not answering or oh no, they're going to block me or something if you take too long to respond. Take your time responding, and if they do those things, that's on them. You are putting time into your response, providing well-thought-out answers, sourcing, and valid criticism. So I'm going to go into sourcing. I, I have a bit more to say there, but this is getting kind of long. I didn't want this to be a super long video. So for sourcing, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but only use peer-reviewed studies and make sure that they are not behind a paywall. Not an article that mentions a peer-reviewed study because a lot of the time they are behind a paywall if you click on them. Not another tweet or comment or Instagram post or whatever that mentions a scientific study, specifically if it does not link it and just mentions the study. It has to be a direct link to either the study itself or a compilation of studies. Next thing is, I know no one wants to hear this, but read them all the way through. Even if you do not have the education to fully comprehend what neurology terms or certain hormones or whatever may mean, although it's good to look those things up, read the whole thing through. Because although abstracts are useful and helpful, there are often things put in throughout that you need to be aware of and that may help your argument. Or in my experience, I've never necessarily found something that would hurt my argument, but that could be very easily misconstrued by someone with an inclusionist idea. Oftentimes things in scientific articles will use long terms and put them into abbreviations that they define at the beginning of the article. And sometimes these are not the most politically correct things. Things like using the word transsexual instead of transgender. So although this should not necessarily dissuade you from using a good article because it has terms that they may not like or wording that could easily be misconstrued, it is good to know that so that before you send them the article, you can explain that they are using scientific language and not colloquial language. 
as well as the fact that sometimes there are things that actually help your argument that are not mentioned in the abstract, like an article that I have on um, an AI detecting uh, brain structure and being able to predict someone's gender identity, including trans people. There is a part at the bottom of that study that is not in the abstract that talks about their motivation behind the study, which is to create more definitive trans healthcare that is more tailored to each person and what they need, as well as being able to find gender dysphoria eventually more consistently and concretely so that we don't have people detransitioning as often. Well, I'm sure there's very few people beyond me who think it's fun to sit down and read a 40 page scientific study. If you're going to cite something, you need to read all of it, especially because a lot of these people do not do that. They will send you a source and then you start reading it and you read past the first paragraph and then you realize, oh, this is on my side. They just didn't get past the first point. And I've actually added an entire study to my sourcing list through someone sending me an article that they thought was on their side because in the first few sentences, it said something about gender being a social construct and then proceeded to go on and prove that that was in fact not the case and it was neurology. Um, so, um, and this, this could also be useful because it may prove you wrong. I've never come across anything like that, but you don't want to embarrass yourself by finding a source and reading a portion of it and then sending it to them and then realizing oh, this doesn't agree with me, which is not just an issue of embarrassment. It's also an issue of if you find something that is disproving your existing position, you need to change your position. But the last point on sourcing is, like I said, a lot of people, including probably most of you, do not want to sit down and read an entire 40 page scientific study. So a thing that I tend to do whenever I use, I put studies in my sources list or whenever I directly send them to people is write a summary of that article that is shorter than the abstract. And I have mine saved um, because I send people the same articles multiple times. Well, not the same person, but the same article, but I send people the same articles to various people. So I would recommend saving them so you don't have to go reread the entire study before you send it to someone again to formulate a summary, but have a, a summary of it. That in, And if there is something um, that is not in the abstract, Make sure that you both explain that it's there if it's relevant, as well as telling them where in the article it came from, what page, what paragraph, and preferably what line, but what paragraph is really sufficient. It's also, also useful to provide direct snippets from the article to copy and paste something and send it, or to provide screenshots of parts of it that are particularly relevant if they are, again, not in the abstract, because most people aren't going to read past that. And of course, this is obvious, but I would recommend you go watch my sourcing video on how to do this or find someone else who talks about it either. Make sure that the article you're citing is actually credible. Just because it's on a scientific journal does not necessarily mean it's peer reviewed or written by a credible person. If you want to go watch that video, I explain how to make sure that the person you're writing, you're reading from is credible, that the journal that you're looking at is actually peer reviewed, as well as providing uh, a link from Yale that lists suspicious and untrustworthy scientific journals. So that seems pretty obvious, but a lot of people will just see that something's a scientific article and assume it's good. That's not always the case. You need to at least loosely, briefly research the people who wrote it, the organization it's coming from, and whatever organization those people worked for beyond just what journal they published it in. As well as being aware that the database that it is published in, like Springerlink or NCBI, is not a journal. That's a database for various journals. The journal name will be at the top of the journal and you can research it based on that because the NCBI, Springer, like those things, PubMed, those, those are databases for scientific journals. They are not the journal themselves. So make sure that the journal, not just the database is credible. And to finish up, just know when it's not worth your time anymore. If they are harassing you and being immature, even if they didn't start out as such, it's if they didn't start out that way, maybe it's okay to go, hey, can we maybe take a break and you can cool down a bit, but in a nicer way than that, um, or just in the conversation, because that's most likely not going to end productively. If you are getting heated, and also if you know you can calm down, this maybe isn't necessarily a sign that you need to stop the conversation, but that you need to step back and calm down and think about why it's making you angry and then decide if that conversation is worth your time. People not taking it serious. People don't have to be mean to not take it serious, but it's not worth your time to argue with someone who doesn't see as much value in the conversation as you do because there's, they're not looking 
to not even just change their mind, but learn about the other side. They're really just looking for a fight. And that's also, again, not worth your time. Uh, buzzword repetition. Now, it's very common for inclusive people to call people transphobic, ableist, whatever. So I'm not necessarily saying if they say one buzzword, you need to end the conversation. It's going to go badly. But if their main argument is you are transphobic, you are ableist, and that's the main thing that they're saying, I'm going to be honest, not necessarily that they're uh, too far gone, but there's really not much you can do whenever they're not going to take your arguments, even if they agree with them very well because they perceive you as a bad person. So if, although, although they may even internally see the value in some of what you're saying, if they see you as a bad person, they're not going to want to consider your ideas because they don't want to be a quote unquote bad person like you. Uh, next and second to last, refusing to care about sourcing. If, if you cannot get past the point that I mentioned at the beginning that they value sourcing, you are not going to get anywhere. Um, so if you can't even get them to not even necessarily agree that sourcing is more important than emotions, you don't, they don't necessarily have to agree with that. Just that sourcing has its place and is valuable, even if they don't agree with you that it's not, or that it's more important. If they refuse to care about it or repeat, it's not a scientific topic over and over again, or, well, I feel this way, that should be enough, that kind of thing. If they refuse to even see the value in it, even if they think the emotion should go along with it. You're not going to get anywhere. And the last thing kind of goes along with that. Uh, pathos over logos. They care about, they, they may agree with the points, like I said earlier, that gender is proven to be neurological. They may even agree that xenogenders aren't possible, but they care more about the feelings of people who identify that way than the actual legitimacy of those identities. Because I've spoken to a lot of people who will agree, yeah, I mean, xenogenders probably aren't real, but what's the harm in it? If they feel that way, we should just let them be happy and fail to see the harm that it's causing to everyone else. So if especially, oh, even more so if they can't, than if they can't see it, if they can see the value in your arguments and just don't care because they think that the emotions of xenogender people are more important than the legitimacy of the harm they're doing, um... I, I mean, there's a place to argue with people like that, but at certain points you really just need to go, okay, this person literally agrees with me and just doesn't care. So, I mean, I could go on about this forever. I said this was going to be a shorter video. It is not a shorter video. Um, I was saying that at the 11 minute mark, I think, and I was like, oh, this video wasn't too long. And then, uh, it kept going. So I apologize for that. But yeah, that's really all I got. Like I said, I could say a lot more on this if anyone wants me to make a part two or something, or if whatever. Yeah. Let me know. Um, also if I got any of the inclusionist definitions off, please let me know. And I will make a pinned comment rectifying that, um, as well as put in the description to read the pinned comment and title. Um, but yeah, that's really all I got for today. Hold there.